So without further ado, I'll introduce our panel, starting with Olivia Shen, our 2019 Fulbright Professional Scholar in Australia United States Alliance Studies. Olivia is currently the da Director of Data Policy in the Department of Home Affairs. Uh, her Fulbright proposal related to the nexus between technology and national security, based at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, DC. She used her time in the US to meet with think tanks, academics, and industry experts to explore the ethical and policy challenges of artificial intelligence. The aim of this work was to inform an Australian national strategy on AI and forge new AI partnerships between Australia and the United States. Thanks so much for joining us, Olivia. We've also got Dr. Taryn Foster, 2019 Fulbright Postdoctoral Scholar funded by Monash University. Taryn is a postdoctoral fellow at the Australian Institute of Marine Science. For her postdoctoral scholarship, Taryn worked with Dr. Rebecca Albright at the California Academy of Sciences on an idea to upscale coral restoration. Coral reefs are suffering from more frequent and extreme coral bleaching events due to climate change. In addition to cutting emissions, restoration is being explored as a means to boost recovery from coral bleaching. However, a major problem in restoration is upscaling to the reef scale. So Taryn's aim was to tackle upscaling by automating current restoration techniques using 3D printing and robotics technology. Thanks for joining us this morning, Taryn. Thank you. We've also got Dr. Koa Kao, 2019 Fulbright Future Scholar in the postgraduate category. Uh, Cohen is, uh, Koa is an Austin Health direct doctor and CEO of Horace AI, a medical AI company previously recognized by the Victorian government in malaria diagnosis. As a Fulbright Future Scholar, Koa undertook postgraduate studies in biomedical engineering at Stanford University to develop a deep understanding of medical technology and strengthen the connections between Australian and American medtech ecosystems. In the future, Koa hopes to harness the power of of advanced medical technology to improve health equity for disadvantaged Australians. Thanks for joining us, Koa. We've got Dr. Annabelle Brennan, 2020 Fulbright Future Scholar, also in the postgraduate category. Annabelle is a doctor working in obstetrics and gynecology. Through her undergraduate studies in medicine and law, she has developed an interest in healthcare governments, particularly safety and quality. As a Fulbright Scholar, Annabelle plans to undertake a Master of Public Health at Johns Hopkins University with a focus on health management and leadership, which will allow her to develop a greater understanding of the interplay between health management and patient safety. She has a particular interest in the role that organizational culture plays in enabling cl clinicians to provide safe, high quality care to patients and their families. Thanks a lot for joining us, Belle. Finally, Dr. Samad Akash, 2024 right, Future Scholar in the postgraduate category. Samad is a doctor and researcher with an interest in global a Bachelor of Medi Medicine and a Bachelor of Surgery for, uh, from the University of Adelaide, as well as a Master of Medicine in Ophthalmic Science from the University of Sydney. As a Fulbright Future Scholar, Samad is currently undertaking a Master of Public Health at Columbia University in New York, where, he's, where he is conducting research into novel methods of eye care delivery in rural and low resource settings. Samad remains optimistic that the solution to ending cataract blindness is within reach of humans at their best. And through his research in the US, he hopes to identify and work towards the most cost-effective means of achieving this. So thanks everyone on our panel, um, particularly Samad and Koa, who are dialing in from um, uh, the east and west coasts of, of the US respectively. And I'll kick off, as mentioned, I'll kick off uh, with some questions relating to uh, just some of the, the key components of the Fulbright Scholarship. So as you can see, the project statement impact statement, personal statement, referee reports, and letter of invitation uh, are some of the, the, the real meat and potatoes of the Fulbright application. And I, I think you'll be interested in, in some of the advice that, that our scholars have to, um, to talk about these uh, components. So Olivia, I'll, I'll start with you. You've, you've been involved with Fulbright for some time, both as a Fulbright scholar and as a, a member on, on our selection committees. So in your experience, uh, what are the most important things uh, that Fulbright looks for in a project proposal, just broadly speaking? Um, so I guess I've had the advantage of being able to sort of see this from both sides of the application process. Um, and I may have done it differently if I knew what I knew now, <laughs> but I would say the three key things are a really keen articulation of your why. And that's, that's across all of the application components. So really lean into 
why this project or this master's program you're interested in, why the Fulbright Scholarship and why you. So there's a couple of components to that. I think if you're applying for one of the postgraduate um, sort of study coursework categories, um, we've been really impressed um, as a selection committee by applications that really articulate why you've chosen that course or that institution um, and really laying out um, the reasons behind it. As a, and sometimes people can be a little bit, they'll just say, well, it's really prestigious, but that's not quite enough. Like we wanna see that you've done your research and really understood the why of why you've chosen this Fulbright scholarship and, and why this institution that you want to be hosted by. Um, and then on, you know, why you is again, what you bring to this experience that will be unique. Um, I think that when you can articulate the meaning of that um, for the scholarship, um, that, that, that really shows in the applications that we see. The second part that I would say is the ambassadorial skills. Um, Fulbright is very much based on this ethos of empathy and cross-cultural collaboration. Um, so you need to demonstrate that you're not just going to be a fantastic student or researcher at the institution you're going to, but that you're going to be an ambassador and a representative of Australia um, to the United States and that you understand the ethos of Fulbright overall as a cross-cultural scholarship program. The third thing I would say is passion and passion is probably a little bit of that X factor that's hard to quantify. Um, but I can tell you that when we see it, we know it. Um, it's in the way you express yourself. Um, it's in the way that you can communicate really clearly um, about your proposal or about your project without being too long-winded, but that the way you express yourself really shows your passion for the topic, um, the passion for what you're doing and how you're going to convert um, that manner of um, your passion into an outcome or your, your passion into a long-term relationship or a long-term collaboration between Australia and the United States. And I know that's a lot to ask sometimes, like you kind of feel like you're only one person. What can I say that is going to have this long-term impact? But the thing is, if you don't have passion for what you're doing, you never actually achieve those goals. So we wanna see that passion. We wanna see it in the way you write about your application and in the way that you express yourself at interview too. That's really wonderful advice. Thank you so much, uh, Olivia. So uh, in summary there, I think, uh, you know, talking about and understanding the why, you know, why ask yourself, you know, why are you, why are you doing what you're doing? Why are you applying for the Fulbright? And, and why would you like to do what you're doing in, in the US? The ambassadorial skills piece is absolutely really crucial and, and agree it's it can be intangible it's different from person to person applicant to applicant and, and proposal to proposal uh, but you know um, your research and looking into the values of Fulbright can really assist you uh, on that on that front and finally absolutely having passion and, and drawing that out you know being able to demonstrate that and articulate that uh, ideally in, in every component of, of the Fulbright application um, will will maximize your chances of success. So you, you mentioned just before that you uh, you may have re, uh, looking back, you may uh, have, have changed how you would have written your application had you had this knowledge. So how do you think you addressed it uh, in your application and, and how would you have uh, potentially changed that? Uh, I think on my application, looking back on it now and having been on a couple of selection panels, I think I focused uh, a lot less on the ambassadorial skills and my personal attributes than I probably should have. Um, in hindsight, I, I focused a lot about um, my research and I put a lot of my own research and preparation into the impact statement more than anything else. I think it was also that that was partly because of the nature of my scholarship, right? So I was a fullback professional scholar. I only had, you know, three to six months to really do everything that I wanted to do. So I needed to demonstrate how I was going to be able to successfully achieve that in a very short time frame compared to some of the other Fulbright scholarships that are more, you know, the postgraduate scholarships. So I think I, I focused a little bit too heavily on that. Um, I still think you should do a lot of preparation in articulating your project and your proposal. Um, but I think those personal attributes, if I was doing it again, I would probably lean more into ambassadorial skills, um, and in my understanding of the Australia, um, 
Australia-US relationship as well, because my professional scholarship was under the US-Australia Alliance banner. Um, so really reading carefully into why someone has even funded the scholarship, like this particular scholarship that you're applying for, and really, uh, I guess, hit the, hit the points that, that that money is trying to achieve is actually really helpful there. Um, and, um, and demonstrating your ambassadorial skills and your interpersonal skills. Absolutely. So, Taryn, as mentioned uh, earlier, your research focused on coral reef restoration, which is, of course, a critical issue for, for Australia. Um, you know, has huge um, economic uh, ramifications uh, on on Australian tourism and, and um, you know, the, the, the ecology of, of, of uh, Australian wildlife. So, um, and, and marine um, ecosystems. So, as mentioned, the application. Um, it's crucial that you make this case for why your study or research must be undertaken in the US. Uh, and and um, on the surface, you know, coral reef um, restoration seems like a, a, you know, an Australia specific or Australia centric topic. So how did you articulate, the, the, you know, the why the US uh, piece in, in your proposal? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question, Alex. I actually did get asked that quite a lot while I was in the States. They were like, so you're studying corals and you've come from Australia to Northern California. Why? <laughs> and um, I guess in my particular project, I was looking at um, how we could utilize technology to upscale coral reef restoration. And so that's why being in the Bay Area was the perfect place for my project. We were um, trying to build a team essentially with the skill sets that I don't have to get this um, idea off the ground. So that included things like design, engineering, robotics, um, AI, automation. And so I was able to get a residency program with a big tech company in the Bay Area, um, Autodesk. And I'm still working with the team that we, that we built there. Um, and I guess in my proposal, I highlighted, you know, that we're having these major issues in coral reef restoration and some of the, the the biggest problems are around addressing this issue of scaling scaling up um, our efforts and being able to actually produce enough corals to have an impact on the reef scale and so we desperately need collaboration with these other industries um, particularly the manufacturing industry and using technology um, to upscale what we're currently doing manually um, so you know, we, we we built this we built this small team, this coral maker team that I work with every week remotely still. Um, but outside of that, being able to go to San Francisco allowed me to build a, a broader network in this space. So I'm I'm also working with um, the Nature Conservancy, a team out of um, out of Stanford University, a design team working also on developing tech for coral reef restoration. Um, I'm on a board for the development of, a, um, of a, a new database in developing tech for coral reef restoration. All of that happened because I was able um, to go to the US to build these networks initially. So I think what Olivia said absolutely um, rings true. Like you, you need to be able to explain what value you're going to add. Like what are you actually going to bring back to Australia that's going to have value? Um, I think... I think having this new knowledge and this new experience is really important, but even more importantly is bringing back those networks and those connections that we really need here to solve some of these problems. Absolutely. That's, that's really fantastic advice. You know, at its heart, Fulbright uh, is, is about collaboration. We're, we're, we're not uh, sort of in the business of, of investing in uh, students or researchers. We're going to head over to the US and, and just remain there. We, we'd really like to see uh, scholars who, who are going to bring that, that knowledge back and, and enrich their, their communities and, and disciplines um, back in Australia. So fantastic advice, you know, isolating the, the, the challenge that we're facing in Australia, linking that to, uh, you know, how they're, how they're solving that in the US or how they potentially have, have better expertise uh, or the potential for collaborating uh, with others to, to, uh, to, to enhance, you know, the, the research itself and then bringing that back, I think. Yeah, yeah. It's essentially bringing, bringing the skill sets together. So we've got some, some amazing coral reef biology um, skill sets here in, West, in Western Australia and on the East Coast, obviously. Um, 
but th that's San Francisco in the Bay Area is like a real hub for technology and AI, robotics. And we need not those things to be separate, but we need them to be integrated to, to actually come up with solutions that are going to work. And I think, um, you know, you can you can do some of these things remotely, but they're, and I think COVID's made us realize this as well. I'm sure you'll talk about that a bit later, but those in-person interactions are just, um, I mean, they're just invaluable. You cannot replace them. So yeah, I think it's really important to, to build those to build those collaborations in person. Indeed. Uh, so Belle, um, you're, you're uh, as a postgrad scholar, uh, your proposal was for a, a master's of public health at Johns Hopkins. And, and we're often asked by postgraduate applicants, um, you know, how, how they can articulate the broader benefits or impact of a Fulbright investment in, in this, in a study program, as opposed to, to a, a research program uh, like, like Taryn and, and Olivia. Uh, so how did you achieve this in, in your application? Yeah, it's a great question. Thanks, Alex. And I'm really glad that you've asked it because I really struggled with this when I was writing my application. Um, each year there are, a, it seems, a lot of junior doctors who apply and most of them want to do Masters of Public Health. Um, and so you, I already came into the application process probably struggling a little with how I could really differentiate myself. Um, and I think any of the junior doctors out there would would or may feel the same just in the sense that we all have to do very similar things along the way so we all have a bit of research we all have a you know some one maybe an extra degree in something um and and some other little things that kind of distinguish you but but um it's easy to feel like you're not doing something particularly different than a lot of other applicants and that and that's just not not true um the first thing that I'd say, which really links back to what Olivia was saying, is, is really understanding the deeper drive or motivation for why you want to do the study. Um, and I think when, if there's people out there who feel that their topic is or their study is, is maybe a bit more vague or nebulous, which is what I did, I, I think that's there's usually two things going on. Either you don't quite understand the real deep driver for why you're doing it and that's okay it often just takes a little bit of thinking about you know ask a couple of whys and try and get a bit deeper the other thing is that actually you might just be interested in really macro system level changes and that's okay and I think sometimes it's easy to think that micro or targeted research it's easy to identify the benefit um, and so sometimes when you have a a really broad macro level interest, uh, I, I think you, you can feel like you, you lose a bit of the value and it's just not true. Both, both of those things are really valuable. So in my application, my, my first kind of iteration was really just that I wanted to upskill myself to take on high level health leadership roles to be able to restructure the Australian healthcare system. Started small. <laughs> Um, but but that's really what I what I wanted to do, and that was my interest. Now, over the course of the masters, that has kind of reshaped itself into understanding how health management and leadership sets the culture, and how then that culture affects the people using the system. So patients, particularly safety, and then clinicians working, so clinician well-being, and that's obviously taken twelve months to kind of really nut out. Um, one of the probably the advice, bits of advice I'd say for the application, um, I don't know if anyone out there has read um, or listened to Jim Collins, who I absolutely adore. Um, and he talks about big, hairy, audacious goals, right? It's, it's being brave to take on the huge thing that everybody says, wow, that just is so big and, and kind of crazy. But it, they're usually just waiting for someone to be brave enough to say, yeah, I want to tackle that. And I think Olivia touched on it as well. I think for the application, the key then is saying, really set out the problem. So you need to be able to really nut, it, nut out what, what is going on? What is the problem with the healthcare system? As an example, what are the problems that, that you're currently seeing or experiencing or facing? And great ways to tell that are storytelling, particularly if you're a medical, um, if you're a clinician or any any sort of health clinician, because you've often got great stories. Um, 
And then the next thing is really, and this goes to Olivia's three whys, right? This, the next thing is really just saying why you are, the, are in a great position to take that on. And then finally, I would be really, really clearly showing what it is that this study is going to do for you. So for me, I think one of the questions I could see was, you know, we can't really highlight which or identify which organisation we want to go to. Um, and that's okay. And you might not know which one you're going to go to just yet. But for me, the, the US offered something really different to Australian MPHs, right? An MPH in Australia, um, a good example is JCU. So they have a particular interest on infectious disease. For my interest, the US is, is the, the mothership of management and leadership. And so I really was able to kind of clearly show what was going on, why I was in a really good position to be the one to take it on and how going to the US and doing this course was going to upskill me or kind of give me the skills, make me better to be able to take on that challenge. Um, I'm sure you're going to say this at some point, Alex, but I'm, I will just flag, I'm very happy um, if there's people who feel like their kind of theme is quite nebulous or they're, they're a bit worried about how they can show the specific benefits, I'm very happy to have people reach out. I can have a look at your application or we can chat. I'm, I'm just get in touch with Alex, but I thought I'd just flag and say, I'm, I'm very happy to help where I can. That's really generous. Thanks so much, Belle. And uh, I, I hope you're taking notes because there was a raft of really, really useful uh, advice there. I won't even attempt to summarize that because there was, just so much packed in there, not just for junior doctors or clinicians, uh, really, really useful advice for, for, for all uh, postgraduate applicants uh, in terms of, um, you know, you, you, can, you, you can sort of shoot for the moon with your project proposal. Um, you know, don't, don't worry about the selection committee thinking you're, you know, naive or, or quixotic for, for tackling uh, a potentially uh, significant uh, issue because you will hone your, your plans um, uh, you know, as, as you as you go through your your study program, um, and that's okay. You know, that's that's, that's exactly what education is, is all about. Uh, so, Samad, um, you're partway through your your two year Masters of Public Health at Columbia. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on how you, um, you know, how you you articulated the, the importance of this investment in your your education. Yeah, thanks, Alex, and thanks for having me tonight. Um, Look, I really, um, I really agree with everything that, every, that, that everyone's already said with Tara and Olivia and, and Annabelle. Um, uh, I guess I'll just elaborate on sort of my slight take on it. Um, and I, I might be paraphrasing what's already been said, but the way that I worked through mine, I think is really useful when people um, ask me about, um, you know, applying for Fulbright is, is sort of actually starting in reverse. Um, I think, you know, when you go to write the question, it says, you know, why is this important? What do you propose to do? Why is the use important? And what's the impact? I think that if you can start with the impact and work backwards, it's really useful. And, and the reason I say that is impact is generally a result of someone's vision. So if you have a very clear vision of what you want changed, or what you think is a problem in Australia, or what you think can be improved, then you can say, if this is achieved, this is going to be the impact for society. So impact is going to vary considerably depending on your discipline, obviously. Um, but, you know, you might be able to say things like, uh, like for me, for example, I work in, um, in ophthalmology and I work in rural Australia a lot. And I, in, and, you know, I worked in Alice Springs and Darwin and Ballarat. And then I also worked in metropolitan centres in Melbourne. And I felt that what I was the potential impact, what my vision was, was that everyone in Australia, given it's such a sophisticated healthcare system and is such a high income country, that everyone in the country, regardless of their postcode, should have access to specialist services. And ophthalmology is quite a good example because it's, there is so much eye disease in rural and regional areas that don't get the same benefit. So one sentence, that's the sort of vision or that's the potential impact. The potential impact is if we achieve that, then the, in terms of healthcare to rural uh, people living in rural regional areas, well, that's as good as it's going to get. Everybody has the same access to it. And then of course you try and, and, and um, you know, mitigate inequality. 
but you've got to have access first. Um, so if you can sort of start with that and say, okay, that's my potential impact. That's what's going to happen. So, you know, if you're in, you, you, you might be in, you know, another discipline, you say, I want to, um, uh, I want to, you know, change something that's really important in culture. Like, you know, it might be like racism or sexism or diversity, regardless of what discipline you're in, like, that's what you want to achieve. And then you've got to sort of find a way of working towards that. Um, so you sort of, if you work for that and then you can kind of say, okay, in order to achieve this, these are the barriers, or this is what I think the barriers are, or this is what I think that we can do in order to do it. And I think that can be, that can be really hard to, and I think um, you know, Olivia and Annabelle both touched on this. It's sort of, it's a bit, it can be a bit nebulous and be like, what could I possibly do in one year in the US to, you know, achieve this huge, you know, mitigate this entire enormous problem. But if you break it down into like in the short term, this is what I plan to do after returning from the US in the medium term, and in the long term, that kind of gives you like some broad timelines for how um, change might occur if you think about it in those three stages. Um, so I think, yeah, try and be specific um, if you can with, you know, um, what the potential impact is depending on your discipline. Um, and then try and clearly articulate um, what, what the issue is that's preventing that impact. So do we need more research in this area? Do we need more funding for that research? Do we, need, do we need policy change? Is that policy change on a state level? Is it on a federal level? Do we need to increase public awareness? Like what are the barriers to achieving the impact? Because then you isolate that in the, in the why is it important? And you may just need to cite a study or two or like you know, give some evidence as to why it's important. Um, and then you can sort of tie in the US at the end. US, you know, this institution, this program, this supervisor, this laboratory, whatever it is, um, is going to help achieve the impact. And so you see at the end, you're sort of tying in why the US is actually essential in order to achieve that impact. Um, and of course, in order to sort of find that out, you need to, you know, you need to, um, you know, look at what the institution is doing, what the research are doing, what the labs are doing. But um, broadly speaking, that, that would be my approach. Think of the impact first. What are the barriers to getting to it? Um, and then how are you going to achieve those in the short, medium, and long term? Well, it's a really interesting approach, like the a mystery novelist approach where you write <laughs> first and then and then work back. It's, I think that's a, that's a great idea. Um, I'll, I'll throw it to Koa now. Um, you, you had a really interesting project, which was which is this, you know, this sort of nexus between uh, medicine and, and technology. Uh, and and uh, I think probably lends itself quite easily to, to uh, you know, why the US, why it's important. But how, how did you go about articulating that in, in your project? Yeah, yeah that was really interesting. Um, so I started out in clinical medicine um, and I, sh I sh did a bit of a shift to engineering, which was really interesting when I was uh, uh, preparing my statement. Um, and because I actually didn't know very much about engineering at that point, um, I took a pretty different tack to what I think other people have done um, in preparing, you know, the statements and the essays, but I actually just tried to speak to as many people as I could um, about, you know, the, the potential in the nexus between medicine and engineering. So I spoke to a lot of researchers, I spoke to a lot of clinicians, I spoke to a lot of engineers, I spoke to a lot of people who worked um, in industry in medical devices. Um, and that's actually how I started to get a sense as to why, you know, what I was doing was important. Um, and so I decided to, you know, um, actually just sit down and, and talk to people and ask them over a coffee, you know, like, um, what sort of value can I bring to you? Um, and that's actually the sort of stuff that I started to um, synthesize in my essay, you know, and, and I initially thought, you know, like as a junior doctor um, and, and someone who just wanted to sort of switch to and start to study engineering, like what value could I potentially bring that? Right? Um, but then I started to learn that a lot of people had, you know, lots of different um, values that they saw in me going to the United States. So for example, I was talking to uh, one of the professors at Monash and they said, you know, they would love to go via me to find new collaborator, uh, like collaborators for their research and um, to bring me back to be able to teach courses for the medical school. Um, and so I actually just created like a giant list of all the different uh, things and advantages that people would raise. And then I just ordered them based on um, how important they were. And that's actually how I wrote the, uh, the essays and, and uh, sort of discussed the impact that I would bring. 
I mean, that sounds like a very, uh, an engineer's approach to, to really logically laying out all the, uh, uh, you know, all the benefits and, and um, you know, potential outcomes from, from your um, proposal uh, and, and laying them out in a logical order. Um, Mike, quickly, there's a question came in right at the start, and I think this is really relevant um, to the current discussion. It's from Grace, uh, and she, she said she's struggling to write five pages on her study plan. She's applying for a master's program rather than a PhD, so she doesn't have a dissertation to discuss in detail. Should I just focus on the importance of the topic and importance of the US to the project? And what style of referencing would you recommend? I'll take care of the, just the um, uh, some of the some technical details there. You don't have to write a full five pages, so don't feel like you have to fluff it out um, to, to get to a, a five-page length. It's just sort of three pages is, is like a recommendation, um, but only write. It should only be as long as it needs to be. Um, but for any of the three postgrads. Um, what are your thoughts on, on you know, whether they sh whether Grace should focus on uh, the importance of the topic uh, or, or importance of, of the US? Uh, I could jump in for this. I actually think it's, I, I feel like both are pretty important in the application because um, often, you know, the importance of the project should be tied to why it should be done in the United States. Like the United States has a lot of different strengths that you can draw on in terms of, you know, whether it's industry or whether it's a specific researcher who's really good in that field that you want to um, that you want to work on. Um, and particularly in the United States, one thing that I found is quite uh, has been quite different is that master's students, you know, are very heavily involved in the university community, involved in university research, involved in university labs. Um, so there's lots of different I guess, advantages that you can draw um, if you really do your research on the university as well? Yes, absolutely. And that goes back to what Olivia said at the start about, you know, you, you don't have to, you know, settle on a particular university, but having just an understanding of the landscape uh, of, of um, higher education in the US in your particular field can really help you discuss some of those, um, you know, uh, you know, geographical or environmental um, benefits for you being over there um, and, and, and studying um, these particular programs and understanding, you know, why these, these programs uh, are, are leading, as, as Taryn mentioned, why, why is this particular program, um, uh, sorry, as, as Bell mentioned, why, why is this particular program so strong um, in, in the US and how is it different to what's offered in Australia? So let's go to the personal statement because we've had a couple of questions about uh, personal statement and it is quite a tricky and, and unique one for the Fulbright. Um, so it, it offers you an opportunity to, to discuss who you are as a person outside of the lab or the office or, or the classroom. Um, Olivia, what was your experience uh, writing uh, the, the um, personal statement? You know, how did you go about it and how did you you approach it differently compared with the, the project proposal? Um, I have to say that in my case, I actually found the experience of writing a personal statement incredibly cringy. Um, <laughs> I think it's, I'm, I'm much more comfortable just saying things that I can do and sort of my academic background and sort of my, my work, but uh, I took I really struggled with this one, actually. It was the last thing I submitted. And in the end, what I, the approach I took was just to be actually really brutally honest. Um, <laughs> I think I wanted to show the authenticity of what I was trying to do and what I was trying to achieve. Um, so I spoke a little bit about how I'd gotten to where I was and what I thought the next step was and why it was important to me at a really, really deeply personal level. Um, you know, aside from, you know, the impact it was going to have or what it would bring my career. It was just about ultimately, fundamentally, why I was intellectually curious in this topic um, and who I was as a person. So I, th I don't think I, I would actually have preferred that no one ever read my personal statement because um, I actually look back on it and it, it actually makes me feel really vulnerable um, how honest I was in what I was talking about. Um, but apparently it worked. So I don't know. <laughs> um, I really didn't know how to pitch it. it. It was quite difficult. It was a bit of a struggle for me. Um, but I would say just go with being as authentic as you can about who you are. Um, and hopefully that's, that's, what, that's what cuts through. 
I think that's wonderful advice. And and vulnerability uh, is is I think a key word. Look, you don't you don't have to uh, you know be be vulnerable in, in your in your personal statement. You don't have to overshare or, or share anything that you're uncomfortable with sharing. But uh, so, something that's sort of unwritten about the ambassadorial skills, I think that selection committee members just um, just sort of holistically read into when when going through these applications is is seeing applicant applicants who who are willing to uh, recognize who they are where they came from where they're going and 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 share that in a genuine and authentic manner is uh, is a really um, good way to demonstrate your ambassadorial skills. Karen, I'm, I'm keen for your uh, insights on this as well. What, what are your thoughts on the personal statement and how you went about it? Yeah, um, I'll have to agree with Olivia. It was very difficult. Um, however long you're planning to set aside to do the personal statement, quadruple that or <laughs> like at least it takes, it takes like, I mean, we don't normally write about ourselves, right? Like you could be someone who writes for a living, but you don't write about yourself very often. And then add to that, you have one page to write about your life journey, your career path and your values, um, which, you know, obviously you can't write about all of that in one page. So you have to, you know, select a couple of threads, I guess, to talk about in, um, in your personal statement. So I guess that would, that would be my advice is just set aside some time um, to really think about it and also think about what what really highlights the reason why you're doing what you're doing um, as some of, yeah as, as as you mentioned Alex this isn't you know the Fulbright isn't just about you going over there um, learning a skill set doing some research you, the Fulbright is about actually sending ambassadors and leaders um, over to to the US and Bringing, bringing knowledge and bringing skill sets and bringing connections back to Australia. So wh while it is a, a deeply um, personal statement, it's also in a way not just about you. Like you have to highlight what value are you going to be bringing back um, to, to our country. So for, for me, well, I, can, I can talk about one of the threads. I don't know how much you want us to go into this, Alex, but I can talk about one of the things that I... That I mentioned. Um, sure. Yeah, please. Yeah. So I, I, I had a couple of threads that I sort of followed throughout the personal statement, but one of them for me was this switch to coral reef restoration. So my background had actually been in um, climate change impacts, ocean acidification impacts on corals. And there was a specific event, um, which was the 2016 coral bleaching event that devastated the Great Barrier Reefs, but also reefs all around the world. And I was monitoring reefs during that time and just saw complete and total collapse of these ecosystems. And that was sort of like a turning point within the coral reef science community, but also a personal turning point for me in terms of starting to think more about, you know, how I could apply um, my knowledge in coral biology to, to start to sort of come up with solutions and, um, and maybe bring people into our industry that could help us um, solve some of these problems but it was it was really like highlighting the, the devastation we all felt like this team of research like people were yeah truly truly devastated by what we saw on the reef and I think yeah I think it's important to highlight those turning points for you because you know you've got your your technical proposal where you talk about all the details and what you're going to do but your personal statement is the only opportunity um, you know before, before you actually get to interview and to, to speak to people in person, but it's the only opportunity where you can talk about, um, you know, why, why are you really doing what you're doing? So I think, I think that's important to focus on that. Absolutely. And, and it, can be, it can be at any point, you know, in, in your life. Like I've, I've read really good examples. There's one, uh, an engineer who, who talked about how they um, started out collecting bottle caps for a, a primary school teacher for, for, for a small project in class and that that spurned her interest in becoming an engineer which was really interesting and there are some you know really uh heartfelt ones uh, where doctors have, have spoken about one particular case uh, in their early career that, that just completely 
uh, change, you know, one patient that changed the, the course of their career and, and stories like that, you know, micro examples that, that uh, encourage them to set their sights on the macro issue, I, I think it can be really, uh, can be really beneficial, but there's no magic bullet approach and everyone will have a different approach. I just think these are really uh, useful, um, you know, um, examples of inspiration to help people write these, these statements. Um, Bell, how, how about you? I'd love to hear how, how you went about your, your personal statement. Yeah, look, obviously I agree with the other two. Um, I think probably two things jumped to mind. Um, one of my referees who um, is one of my research supervisors and a supervisor at work um, had said to me, uh, she, she's been a very, very dear mentor. And she said to me, I want you to try writing the referee letter first and email it to me and I'll have a read. And I thought, oh my God, that's so awful. How do you write a referee letter about yourself to the person that you want them to? <laughs> She's a very, also very high up in the specialty. She's very well, world renowned. And I thought, oh, this is mortifying. Um, anyway, I spent a lot of time writing this letter thinking, okay, I, I think I've, you know, I, I haven't oversold it, but I've, you know, <laughs> what I got back was just the most beautiful thing I, anyone has ever written about me. And I was really, really, truly overwhelmed at, at the reference that she had written for me. Um, and I think that was just a really, really useful experience in what I had written about myself was really sterile. Um, it was probably quite bog standard and probably described a lot of people in, in medicine, but also in other, in other areas. And what actually what she had kind of highlighted about me were just really thoughtful, considered comments that, um, that were much more reflective of, of the hard work that I had done and the type of person that I am and the future that I have. And that was just a really useful, I'm not suggesting everyone do that, but it, it's a really useful experience. And it made me actually think differently about my skill set um, and the values that I have. So I think um, just make it, it, it's more than your CV, okay? You're sending in your CV. The personal statement is not a chance for you, to, like you would write a cover letter, which is often, again, just a, re a rehash of the things in your CV. It's, it's so much more than that. And it's an opportunity for you to, to take all of your skills, but, but show how, how, how that's you. You know, you are more than the courses you've done. You are more than the, the letters that you've got or the, or the things that you can do. You are kind of one person all tied up. And so one of the, it's really hard to do, but one of the things, if you can look at your CV and look at your skill set and tie things together, how did, how does that skills that you can do relate to this um, really interesting experience you have? And how does that kind of link into some of the values that you have as a person? And so being able to kind of weave, I think Taryn mentioned as well, weaving some threads and weaving it into a story, um, it's hard, but but that's what's engaging. That's what shows that you have, as Olivia said, you have passion. Um, it, it takes time for you to sit down and think about it. But also, I think having spent now 12 months in the U, like with, with US colleagues, I'm a lot better at selling my value and, and understanding my value. So I, I would say, um, don't, don't be afraid to, to highlight what you're good at and highlight what is important about you and and show people that you are someone special and you have some big thing that you want to achieve it's good you don't have to be you don't have to kind of pull it back and and kind of tone it down that that one page is your chance to go listen up i'm here pick me absolutely and, and it's, like it's a really unique opportunity for you to put yourself on a page and, and really analyze you know where, where you've come from and, and where you're going um but it's, you know, one of the, the hardest protagonists in the story you'll ever have to write is, is the one where, where it's you. So <laughs> I, I agree. It's, it's, 
a really tough experience. Uh, Samad, what, what are your what are your thoughts? I'd love, love to know how you you went about yours. Uh, yeah, yeah. So again, I echo the other sentiments. I think um, it's really hard to do the personal statement. Um, look, I, I'll I'll describe to you my first paragraph because for me, when I sort of sat and thought about, it, I was like, why have I ended up where I am? Like, why am I doing this specialty? Why do I want to do public health? Like, what do I really care about? Um, and sometimes I think telling, you know, maybe you're like family that or your partner that or at a dinner party, like you express a different answer depending on the situation you're in. And for me, I just sort of, I really just, I knew I was doing it, but I really had to like isolate it because you've only got one page, right? So if you do, you're like, do you have an example of what really got you interested in whatever you're doing? Like, I think it's a good opportunity to describe that um, like with some flair. My example was I was in medical school at the time. Um, so I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And I, I'd always sort of been interested in cost effectiveness, like getting bang for buck out of medical treatment. It's like, that's sort of broadly what I was into. Um, and I came across this journal article, it was an editorial. It was written by this ophthalmologist who, um, uh, and, and it was essentially just, it, it was talking about global ophthalmology. So eye care in low income countries. And he, the first, the first part of the editorial, I thought this was quite unusual because it was an academic journal, was a conversation between an alien and an ophthalmologist. Um, and in ophthalmology, you have this eye disease called cataracts, which is super common. It accounts for the majority of blindness in the world. And it's super easy to fix. It's like a 15 minute operation to fix it. Anyway, so this academic journal and you know, obviously caught my attention because it was a discussion between an alien and an ophthalmologist. And the alien basically lands on earth, meets this ophthalmologist and sort of says, says to the ophthalmologist, like, well, what's your leading cause of blindness on this planet? And the ophthalmologist is like, oh, it's cataracts, obviously. And the alien looks at the ophthalmologist, like, you know, quite a strange looking. He's like, that's really weird that it's your leading cause of blindness. We've got the exact same thing on the planet that I'm from and we fix it with a 15 minute operation. And the ophthalmologist is sort of like, sheepishly like oh we've we've got that operation here as well and the aliens like why is it your leading cause of blindness you know it doesn't make sense and that for me I mean that was just I just read that and was like that really doesn't make sense <laughs> um and then I ended up hitting that I ended up um, emailing that professor and um you know expressed that I was really really interested in it and then it ended up actually going to Myanmar with him and did some work in ophthalmology there and that's sort of like that was really the catalyst for me then kind of going into low income countries, doing the work. And like, that really kind of is the reason that I am where I am now. Um, so I described a conversation between an alien and, and an ophthalmologist in my personal statement. And I described how I then emailed this professor, which then led me to go to Mino, which then led me to go to Ethiopia, which do you know what I mean? And I, without I sort of I wasn't just trying not to like indulge in like experience that I experiences that I had had but it really informed my sort of passion for inequity in access to eye care in the world um, and I think by the end of the page that just came through really clearly um, so that was my approach like I really isolated one example and then the trajectory um, so that, that, I mean, my advice would be if you do have some sort of, you know, example that's led you to where you are or was profound in your academic or your personal life, um, and you can try and build on that, um, you know, try and be personal, be unique. And um, I think if you can do that, you'll be amazing. I love that. It's like one of my favorite personal statement stories <laughs> so far. <laughs> so, I mean, satire is the best way, you know, to, 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 to expose like uh, or highlight absurdity with, with humor, I think is, is the, is a, a fantastic way to, to engage someone and get them on board with uh, with with your story. Um, Koa, you know, for someone who's very uh, clearly very logical minded, how did you approach this very very difficult uh, process of of uh, explaining who you are as a human being, which can often be a very confusing and illogical process? Yeah, I mean, so this was. Um... You know, I, I remember finishing the personal statement and going to talk to my parents and I was like, you know, I basically put like a piece of my soul on this like sheet of paper, this single page, right? Um, 
and I've heard this, I heard the saying before I applied and I didn't realize like the meaning until after I applied, but they say that even if you apply and you don't get it, like you come out of the process knowing yourself so much better, like what drives you, like why you do what you do, um, like who matters to you. And, and so, yeah, for me, it was really like um, just thinking about the people. Um, I, yeah, I took a bit of a different tack again, like just thinking of like the people who had changed my path um, in life and, and, you know, had steered me right at, at a certain crossroads and, um, and sort of shared with me like really pivotal um, experiences that changed the way I think about the world. Um, and yeah, so I just really just sat down and, and had a fair bit of fun with it. I, I don't know if I, um, you know, I had a bit of fun with just thinking like reminiscing back to like, you know, when I was really young and my grandpa who was a doctor would teach me like all these random lessons, which I now realize has really influenced how I see things. Um, and then, you know, when I was at the World Health Organization and, and like just learning about stuff and realizing that there's paths outside of clinical medicine. Um, and yeah, so I just really sort of knitted them, you know, all together. And that's how I wrote the personal statement into a sort of tapestry that made some sort of sense. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, that sounds like a, a really, um, a really good way to go about it. Again, you know, in a in a pretty logical sense, I think you've you've tackled that, that problem well, and obviously it worked. Um, look, I'm really mindful of the time. Uh, that hour just went by really quickly, uh, so we're definitely going to go over time. But but if any of the panelists have to leave, then feel free to just um, just make the I have to leave sign and, and then and then sign off as soon as you have to. Um, but otherwise, I'll, I'll just kick on. <laughs> um, I'll go to some audience questions just in case, uh, you know, some of the audience members have to leave. But I'll remind everyone that this session is being recorded and we'll, we'll upload um, to our YouTube channel. Um, so I was going to, I have a question about impact statements, but uh, an audience question about it. So I'll, I'll just throw to them. So uh, Tana has asked, in regards to the, the future and state-based personal statements, did you end up writing similar things to your main statement and research objective? So um, is it the same selection committee who looks at all the statements or is it a separate committee who looks at the future and state statements? That's a really good question. Again, I'll tackle the, just the technical issues there. Um, firstly, Tanner's asking a really relevant question. You can apply for multiple statements with the one application, just if you indicate on the checklist, you know, I'd like to be considered for the, the state scholarship. I'd like to be considered for the future scholarship. Uh, this this will mean that you'll, you'll be considered in multiple um, scholarship categories in front of multiple selection committees. So in answer to, to um, your question, it's a different different uh, committee. The state committee will look at your state impact statement and um, the, the, the um, Fulbright Future uh, Committee will look at your, your future impact statement. So, so it's good, yeah, it's good to, to diversify, uh, to, to, you know, you don't have to uh, worry about repeating information. Um, but for uh, our impact statement writers, so our future scholars, and, and Olivia and Taryn, if you wanted to weigh in, um, how, did you, how did you approach the, the impact statements? Uh, and and did, you, did you double up on, were you concerned about like doubling up on, on information? Um, Some I'll, 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 I'll start with you. Uh, yeah, I think it's a really relevant question. And I remember thinking the same thing. Um, you know, you've just spent, you know, written, you know, the four pages of the other one and then the future one. Um, I, I did have a little bit of double up. I think there was maybe one or two paragraphs, which were just really, I thought, salient from my uh, research proposal that, that, I, that I included. Um, but it wasn't a straight up copy paste. Um, I did focus on, um, like, the Fulbright future does focus on, you know, prosperity of Australians and impact. Um, and sort of, as I was explaining before, um, I think that's like a really important thing to think about. Um, I, I would just generally speaking, steer away from, and I think Taryn described this before, like avoiding describing just how it's going to benefit your career. Um, and as, as I have come to understand Fulbright more now being one year into my program, like, and the Fulbright Future Scholarship especially is how it will benefit Australians. Like how will Australian you know, society or healthcare or theatre or art, whatever it is, be better off as a result of Fulbright Future giving you that funding to go to America. Um, so that's really what I would have in my mind. 
um, what's, you know, what's Australia getting? Because I think that's what Fulbright Future is investing in to improve Australia. So, um, you know, if you can try and avoid statements that just pertain to um, how you'll advance your career. Absolutely. Belle, what are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, I'd have to agree. I think um, my I'm just reflecting back on my my um, papers, and I I think there was quite a, a significant amount of overlap. Um, but as as some had said, just kind of really directing what each um, and also the state. So the state for the state based ones, your state might have like the Northern Territory will have very different goals or may potentially have very different goals in whatever industry you're in compared to New South Wales. So um, for the state paper, it's probably a little bit easier because you can maybe drill down even a little bit further on those interests. Um, I think that's probably all that jumped out at me. Yeah, absolutely. Textbook advice, you know, each state has a particular, uh, you know, social or, or economic or, or research priorities so look into those and, and if your project fits within that the, the remit of, of what they're trying to prioritize then um you'll, you'll be able to make a really strong um uh articulation of, of potential impact if if it's not you know if your research isn't a priority then then maybe drill down into why it should be um uh, couple, sorry go ahead Oh, sorry to interrupt. I was just going to say like, for the future scholarship, um, it, it's a huge level of support. It, it, it's like, I, I just can't even, <laughs> like, I, I'm just so grateful for, for having one of those scholarships because it, it honestly just covered everything. And for, for someone to, they're, they're making an investment in you, right? So so you're not just getting a, a small scholarship to cover the cost of doing your MPH it, at Melbourne Uni. This is a, an immense investment in you as a, as we've said, as an ambassador, as a scientist, as an artist, as a um, advisor, as an analyst, whatever, whatever it is that your area is in. It's someone saying, we can see that investing in you is going to be cha dramatically changing either the state or the country. And, and I think un understanding that and having an appreciation of that will, will help your app, will take your application to the next level, right? Understand what, what they're doing for you. And then you want to show them back. This is why you should invest in me because it's it's going to be a good investment and I'm and and this is what I'm going to do and it's it, as we said before it might be big vague nebulous but that's great that's great that's big long term stuff that you're saying hey I'm going to, I'm going to do this and this is what you're going to get out of it at the other end absolutely and and you know the the impact statements are, are about half a page so you know maybe you could take some ads approach of, of writing that first and then and then working back from there um Kyle, Kyle, how about you yeah for me like the advice i would have is i think with you know obviously like given a certain situation like you can only optimize so much for how much impact you could have with your trajectory right and so it's really like getting really involved in your career like like really getting passionate about what you do like so much so that you're at an area where it's like so obvious to you like how much impact you could have it's so obvious like how much you could do that the problem you have is actually how to articulate it in like the clearest way right and i feel like that's when you know that like you know you have a really strong chance of getting um the full right just because it will be very clear to the people reading it that you're someone who's very involved in what you do you're very passionate about what you do um and that's actually i think the best way to optimize for impact um is really just try and get impact you know without the fulbright um before you apply for the fulbright and then and then you know it shows how much more you can achieve afterwards absolutely um so uh another question is coming in uh, about um, so for, for Olivia, uh, Annabelle, uh, so for those who, who apply for master's programs, um, the Fulbright postgraduate application instruction specifically says do not mention specific US universities. 
what's the thinking behind this instruction, not to mention this aspect, especially, especially if we know the specific institutions, courses and academics for the preferred master's program. So uh, uh, there's, there's a couple of things there. Um, the tricky thing about the Fulbright application is that it services 160 programs and every program is different. So some of the wording there doesn't necessarily apply to the Australian program. We, for instance, um, we, we disagree with, with that wording about not mentioning specific instance as institutions. And the thinking behind uh, the, that um, f from uh, the Fulbright global perspective is, which kind of makes sense, is that if you tie your proposal to one specific institution, like I want to do a, an MPH at Harvard for these reasons. If you, if you don't get into Harvard, then you're essentially your, your proposal collapses. Of course, there are other programs, but uh, Fulbright are looking for, for students who, who um, uh, you know, are going to be able to, to achieve their goals regardless of what institution uh, they're, they're headed to. But um, as we've said throughout this panel, you can definitely mention uh, specific uh, inst institutions or programs just to demonstrate that you've done the research. And if anyone has any anything to add to that, uh, just let me know. Otherwise, I'll, I'll throw it at the next question. Hopefully that answered your, your question uh, anyway. Um, another slightly uh, sort of technical question. I understand the project and personal statements are critical, but I'm curious how much detail you look at the CV resume if we cannot elaborate on other relevant experiences in those documents. Uh, so, um, I might ask Olivia for her thoughts on, on this one, um, but um, we tend to look at the CV in less detail than we look at the, the project and personal statements. Um, but it, it's good to demonstrate in your CV uh, that you know you, you have um, some experience outside of just your specific career trajectory you know if you've done anything uh, any anything in the community or, or um, if there's anything that demonstrates your ambassadorial skills um it's just good to, to show a diversity of, of of a career trajectory but it's not it's not 100 percent necessary but olivia what, what are your thoughts from reading applications uh yeah i would definitely agree with that uh, i think we've focus a bit more on the impact statements and the personal statements rather than a CV. Um, I think it's partly also a recognition that, you know, you, you send your CV out for job applications, whereas this is a bit more of a holistic scholarship program. Um, and some things that people would um, exclude from a very professional looking CV, they should actually absolutely definitely include in a Fulbright scholarship application, including the things you talked about um, in terms of your community involvement, um, things that you've achieved over and above beyond the professional setting is actually some um, things that tend to sort of capture the imagination and the attention of a selection panel. Um, so yeah, it, the CV is probably less important in that sense. Um, I actually in the in my shortlisting process in my head, I actually just do a little bit of a cross reference with the CV like you know, if there's things that are interesting to me that haven't been mentioned, it's something I may make a note of. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's probably less of a focus. Absolutely agree with that. Um, so again, if, just a few more technical questions, which I'll, I'll run through. Um, does the committee keep the balance between different disciplines in awarding a scholarship or not necessarily? I think yes. I think we, we try not to award, you know, 50 scholarships to, to, um, to law um, graduates or, or, you know, just uh, only uh, all of our scholarships go to, to scientists. And in order to, uh, to, to you know, um, improve equity, you know, we don't want to eliminate a, a candidate just because they're as good as a, you know, if there's one lawyer who's as good as another lawyer. So really, you know, um, in order to improve that, we've just been expanding the scholarship program uh, as much as possible over the past five years. So it's gone from, from about 50 scholarships a year um, to about 150. So that, that is just additional scholarships for everyone who, who, you know, we can possibly award a scholarship to. Um, based on merit and, and ignoring um, discipline. 
uh, in saying that, you know, we, we, we just, we, we like the, the cohort to represent an accurate cross section of, of the academic landscape in Australia. So, um, and, and, you know, the, the number of the, the, the disciplines have applied to the Fulbright program. So uh, in, in that sense, um, you know, we do try to, to make sure that there's a little bit of a, of a balance um, in each cohort. Um, so another one, is it, is it necessary to provide an impact statement uh, if you're not applying for additional awards? No, if, if you're not applying for, for any, uh, the, the two or three awards that require an impact statement are the, the future program, the state scholarships, and um, uh, actually, there's a couple, I think there's, there's a, a Monash postdoc now requires a, a, an impact statement and the Deakin postdoc as well. Um, but just make sure you're reading um, on the, the individual award pages to see which ones require an impact statement and the general category does not require one. Um, what are some of the country specific materials and additional materials? Those are simply spots at the end of the application where you can upload your impact statements. Again, the, the portal is the service is 160 programs. So they've just provided little spots where country, country specific uh, materials such as these impact statements can be uploaded. You can also upload any additional like portfolios and stuff like that, if they're relevant. Um, uh, last question was about uh, your passport. I've renewed my passport in the last two weeks, not expecting to receive an addition, an updated passport. Um, should I submit my outdated passport? Yes, that's fine. With technical issues like that, we can we they'll come out in the wash. We can we can sort out. You know, if, if you you've applied for your Australian citizenship or, or something like that, and you just haven't quite yet received it, or you haven't quite received your updated passport, just up, upload any documentation we can and we'll, we'll question you uh, following the application process if, if you're successful in, in, in proceeding, but you won't be eliminated for any technicalities, like a, you know, a slightly, um, you know, you haven't received your transcript yet or, or something like that. Uh, should I include an academic transcript from a former university from 20 years ago? No, you don't have to. Uh, not, and I wouldn't recommend doing that unless you reference it in your um, application, or, or if, if you know, if you got super outstanding marks and you just want to, you know, show it off, then, then feel free to upload it. You won't be penalised. Or um, a couple of different instructions. One says personal statement is one page. The other two pages. Please confirm. It should be one page. It can go over a little bit, but I recommend one page. Um, Okay, what about recommendation letters? And I, I had a question about this. So let's just cover recommendation letters because it's a really important uh, topic. And, and just to confirm with the panelists, are you, are you all, we've, we've gone over time by about 10 minutes. Are, are you all still okay to, to, to carry on? Yeah, all good, awesome. Yeah, Olivia, I'm worried about you. You're a very busy, busy lady. No, all good. Um, okay, so uh, referee letters, really important part of the, the application you know it's like a job application it just lets us know that what you've said in your application can be backed up with uh you know with, with qualitative evidence from from people that, that you know people that you work with um and ideally you know people who have a, an air of authority um to them it's not necessary that you have to go to the vice chancellor or something but it's good to know that, that a supervisor um uh or, or department head or something thinks highly of you. Um, so, and you know, there's a mix. You can go with personal or professional. Um, Olivia, what are your thoughts? As a selection committee member, I'd, I'd love to know your thoughts on um, you know, how, how, do you, how did you go about getting your referee? Um, who did you choose for your, your referees and how did you go about getting these letters? So in terms of my selection of my referees, um, I did try to um, get the most impressive people I know, um, but I think there's a fine balance between getting the most impressive people you know and the most impressive people you know that actually know you. Um, so I was trying to find that balance there. Um, throughout the course of my professional career, I've been able, had the great opportunity to meet and work with some really great people. So all of my referees were professional referees. Um, and I was hoping that they were going to be the kind of people who, who could speak to my impact in particular, because it was a, mine was a research scholarship. So I had, I ended up having 
I actually had, there's three that are required, but I did a backup just in case, um, because it, often when you're asking impressive people to submit a, referee, a reference for you, they tend to also be very busy people. Um, so ask them soon and ask them well in advance and get them across um, what you're trying to achieve with the scholarship and, and what your application looks like. I think that actually takes a bit of time too. Um, so I ended up having uh, an ambassador, a deputy ambassador, a Navy admiral, and a chief economist as my referee, uh, as my referees. Um, I think I chose them again because they could speak to how I'd worked in the workplace, but how I stood out in the workplace um, in terms of the impact I had, or in terms of an ability to think a bit more creatively and a bit more outside the box. Um, so I was really trying to target that in particular. Uh, one of my referees did a slightly funny thing, which is sort of similar to what um, Taryn spoke about, about um, her mentor asking her to write her own referee report. So I had one of my referees actually ask me to draft it. And then, um, so one of the unique things about this process is you don't actually get to see the references that are written for you. They're just submitted. Um, and so I don't, I don't actually know what the final version looks like, but <laughs> it was an interesting way of actually pitching yourself as well. Um, and I think the referee reports really do go a long way. Um, we comb through them quite closely um, as a selection committee, both to get a sense of the person and to get a sense of um, how they relate to other people, how other people view them, and as opposed to just their claims about how they're viewed. Um, so yeah, like I think Alex, as you mentioned, it's a little bit of that validation of not just a person telling us about them, but what do other people say? What do other people say when they know that the applicant isn't actually going to see the referee report? Um, I have seen some missteps as well where people go for someone who doesn't know them that well. Um, and you can, that also shines through actually. Um, I, can, I can recall a couple of applications we've had where people just went to a well-known individual someone who like is a household name. Um, but the referee report actually ended up being so short that it was clear this well-known individual didn't actually know that person that well or how they operate. So um, just, just tread carefully there. Absolutely, it's really good advice. Um, I, I absolutely concur with that. Um, and something that, that scholars have, have mentioned, successful scholars have mentioned to me in the past is how they shared their uh, project proposal with their referees just to let them know I think that's incredibly good advice I think you know if the the if the referee knows a little bit more about what you're planning to do uh, it can it can really help them tailor um, you know what 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 they want to write in the letter and again it just it evidences that they they know you and they know what you're planning to do um, a little bit more so I think that's that's really good advice uh, and sorry just to cap off the, the, the original question was whether a referee letter uh, and a recommendation, uh, sorry, recommendation letter and referee report uh, were different things, but no, they're, they're exactly the same thing. Sorry, I'm just, I'm just confusing people with the wording. They're, they're, they're the same thing. Referee letter, recommendation letter, yeah, same thing. Um, so heaps of uh, questions about uh, impact reports. Annabelle, I think you indicated you wanted to, to answer that, but was that prior to? Oh, no, I was actually just trying to write um, that we had probably discussed that pretty in depth earlier. And so I just was going to say that they, they could just watch the recording for the first portion of our discussion. Absolutely agree. And uh, look, if you have any, any more specific detail of your questions about the, uh, the impact uh, reports, then, um, then feel free to, to, um, to shoot them through. Um, is the future, is the Fulbright Future Scholarship only for students? No, absolutely not. It, it's for every category uh, of, of Fulbright. So if you're a scholar or postdoc, um, feel free to, to, to or, or professional, feel free to, to apply. Um, So again, the, the future impact report, you need to give details on the study design or focus on the impact of the study. Does the panel also see the proposal? Absolutely, they, they look at these documents in tandem. So they won't just see your, your impact statement, they'll see your proposal as well. I mean, if, if you wanna recycle a little bit from your project proposal, like if you've, if you've spoken about the impact in your project proposal and you don't wanna just, you know, 
rewrite the same thing, then feel free to, to, to copy it over because it's, it's still relevant. Um, uh, but but uh, yes, they'll, they'll, see, they'll see both documents in tandem. Um, what about rec recommendation letters? Uh, is it not recommended for referees to refer to a specific preferential institution as well? Um, I, I, I'd probably say that they, if they've seen your proposal and, and they, they, they're reading into some of the research you've done about the landscape, then they can definitely mention that. But, but again, if your, your reference, um, if your recommender is saying, I think this candidate would be a great um, candidate for the, the MPH at Johns Hopkins, then, then that's, I probably wouldn't recommend them going into the weeds that much. Um, so the application portal, portal appears to indicate the impact statement is part of the three to five page study plan uh, for general postgraduate and postgraduate future. Um, however, the discussion appears to suggest that this is a separate document. Uh, can you clarify how the impact statement should be included? Uh, so um, the project plan, your, your study research proposals, that they are indeed a different document. And as mentioned just, just now, you can include the impacts, you know, you can articulate the impact and, and the why of, of, of your research in your project proposal, and we recommend that you do so. The, the real function of these impact statements is that when we collate all of the, the applications at the end, it's just really useful for us to, to give, um, to, to isolate these documents so that when the selection committees are reading them, they can say, okay, project proposal, boom, 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 you know, here are all the boxes, it ticks, um, personal statement, boom, 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 impact statement, okay, they're applying for the future, so, so what is the specific impact? In that sense, I'd recommend when you're writing your project proposal helps to include a headings just again, so you can further isolate some of the important details within your project proposal. Um, does anyone on the panel have, have uh, any, any insights into that? Just about, um, I, I guess just about, uh, you know how, how you 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 know whether you you include a lot of detail on the impact in your proposal or, or whether you you would save some of that for the impact statement. Um, so when I uh, answered my uh, proposal, I um, I just divided it into four headings and I actually wrote the headings um, and I just found that helped to answer the, to write the application. So it was, why is it important? Um, why do you, what do you propose to do and how do you propose to do it? Um, why is the US important and what's potential impact? And I answered those four in my proposal. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we covered a lot of that uh, in the discussion. So again, go back to the recording if um, some of that is, is unclear. Um, a letter of recommendation recommendation from someone in your own organization is that a negative absolutely not i mean we we expect to see letters of recommendation from people in, in, in your own organization it helps if you can find at least one outside of your organization because obviously your university or, or institution has a vested interest in, in in seeing you you know seeing this investment in, in your your capabilities and knowledge but you know, if you can't, it's another question here, which is really relevant. If you're early in your career, second year PhD, would it be okay if three letters are from your own institute, two current supervisors and a former honours supervisor? I think, I think it's fine. I mean, you might, might find that you can find a personal reference or, or a, um, just someone outside, you know, a colleague you've worked with or a collaborator um, that might just balance it out a little bit more. Um, yeah, panelists, do you, do you have any 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 comments on on, on finding your Taryn? I, I did have something to add. I think so. I did pick all professional referees. I had um, people from my workplace, like bosses and um, my old PhD supervisors. Um, I think you do have to have a mix of people who know how you work, people who know you professionally, and people who know you personally. And if it's someone who knows you in both ways, then that's great. Um, but one thing I will say is that you need to have at least one referee who knows like not just where you've been, but where you're going, because they could be different things. Um, 
for me, I was jumping completely in the deep end. Like I had this, this research, um, you know, pure coral biology background and I was going into, you know, robotics and engineering and technology development and product design. Like, of course I had no idea about any of those subjects. And so I think it's really, really valuable to, like you, like you mentioned, Alex, either to have them look at your project proposal. So have sort of a, a glimpse into what you're planning um but just someone who understands like your vision for your future and can support you and and trust you um or trust in your capabilities to deliver on that even if it's something you haven't done in the past absolutely um it's a really good question and it's a tough one actually um given the advances in online communication that's come about since covid are you finding that it's more challenging for applicants to justify being in the u.s in person Yes, I mean, <laughs> last year, um, uh, like, I don't think the sort of full ramifications of, of COVID had settled um, by the time the application due date rolled around. Uh, Annabelle, I think you applied mid-COVID, so I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, about yeah I was actually going to put my hand up to speak to this. I think I'm probably the only one on the call that didn't physically go to the US. Um, so I had wanted to do this study with a Fulbright scholarship for about 10 years. Um, so I, I was at uni, I did a double degree with my medical degree and about halfway through that I thought I want to go to the US and do this masters because as I said, um, it's just very, very different, um, uh, st study mix or I suppose um, topic mix than than most of or any M MPH that's offered in Australia. So I, I knew that the US was going to be uh, offer something that I couldn't get in Australia, which is not going to be the same for everyone. But but if that's the case, then that's what you hold on to. Um, I I was set to start in the June, so it was all I did a complete coursework MPH. So there's no research component. I was set to start in the June, July, and then in the end we pushed it to September and then the numbers just got worse and worse and worse. Uh, and then Hopkins were completely online until January. And then come January, the commission asked if I wanted to go, um, but Hopkins were really only offering one course a week or two courses a week, essentially out of purpose to get their international students into the country. Um, and I was finishing at the end of May, so I made the decision with my husband to stay in Australia. Um, that's not going to suit everyone, and, and it was a very, very difficult dis decision to make. Um, there is still a lot of um, emotion <laughs> tied to that, but um, I would say uh, it was a different a different experience to what I expected, but it was just a, an absolutely stellar year. Um, I got just as much, if not more out of it because I, I kind of, you you know that you're online. So you, you make those connections, you organize those meetings, you seek out, you talk to people. Um, I think it was just, it was, it was a different year to what I expected, but it was in no way less valuable being online. Um, so I, I think it just so depends on, on every individual. If you're going to meet a particular person or work in a particular lab, okay, you gotta go. But, but if you're doing coursework, don't be put off by, by um, you know, the, the potential um, doing it online. I think just be open and that's the whole purpose of Fulbright, right? Be open to different experiences and, some of that means you just have to shift your headspace and you and you have a something you didn't you didn't expect, but it will all be valuable. Absolutely agree with that. Um, one thing we haven't touched on is uh, the letter of invitation, which which is only relevant for, for scholar applicants. So Taryn, you'll be best placed to answer this. Uh, how did you go about um, you know, securing this letter of invitation uh, from the, the Cal um, Institute of the Sciences? Did you, did you have a prior relationship with them or did you just reach out and, and, um, and ask? 
Yeah, so the coral reef science community is quite a small one. <laughs> so I actually did know my host. Um, her and I had both worked, um, Rebecca Albright, her and I had both worked at the Australian Institute of Marine Science, but on different sides of Australia. So I was in Western Australia and um, she was at Ames in Townsville. And we also had like very similar career um, trajectories. So we'd both worked on climate change and ocean acidification impacts on corals. And then we'd both sort of switched our focus as sort of the situation with coral reefs um, declined. And particularly after the 2016 coral bleaching event, we both started focusing more on coral reef restoration. Um, and she was like several years ahead um, in her career. And so I did, I did know her previously um, from afar, but we we also had we also had um, interests that were really aligned, and my interests were also really aligned with the California Academy of Sciences um, as a host institute as well. So Cal Academy focuses um, a lot on restoration, not just in the marine world, so not just on coral restoration, but also um, terrestrial restoration, and they call it rewilding there. Um, and so I think I think definitely. Um, reach out to people within your network if you have someone that you would like to work with or if you can get like a you know if you can get an, an introduction email or something like that I think it's helpful to get a toe in the door but more importantly than that I think you need to really align with people who are interested in your um, in, in your area and have similar similar goals to you I think that alignment is is more important whereas introduction is sort of that sort of just gets them to open their email, <laughs> I guess, but they're not going to, they're not going to host you if they're not interested in what you're doing. So I think do your research and um, yeah, pick, pick an institution and a host that, um, that sort of shares your values and your goals. Definitely. Something, yeah, something that shares uh, your values, your goals, um, there's potential synergy uh, and, and let them know that you're applying for a Fulbright scholarship because it's a really, really well-known program uh, over there with a, with a really solid reputation. And, um, you know, that, that might really spur their interest in, in supporting um, and hosting uh, the work that you'd like to do. Uh, just a couple more uh, technical questions. Uh, Lily's concerned about uh, submitting additional documents, i.e. impact statement under the wrong section. Uh, under additional documents or country specific materials, will the documents still be found okay in this case? Yes, absolutely. They're, they're, um, those little upload sections, all they do is reorder the, the, where the documents uh, are found. In our PDF instructions, that gives you a pretty good idea of, of where you should upload things. But if you accidentally upload somewhere, some, a document elsewhere, then it'll still be in your application just in the next page or the previous page, depending on where you uploaded it. It, it can help if you combine all if you have lots of relevant documents if you can combine them all into one pdf that just saves you the, the the stress of wondering whether it's going to be included or not and no you won't be penalized if, if, you, if your documents are you know, in, in a different order um okay two more questions uh, about the letter of invitation and then we'll wrap up um an academic reference essential for a postgraduate graduate application, or should the best possible references be prioritised if you didn't develop a particularly strong relationship with any uh, professors during university? Um, I think it depends on, on what your project is. I think if your project is is is, is an academic project and, and um, you're proposing to do study. I think it's pretty important to have an academic reference, but um, what, what do you on the panel think? Um, so I was a post, I'm, I'm a postgraduate, I'm doing an MPH and um, I didn't have any uh, research supervisors for mine. Um, uh, I can't remember who told me this, but when I was applying, somebody said to me like references is a good opportunity to fill gaps in your overall application. Like if you're sort of trying to communicate like who you are, what you're about, you know, your research experience, your professional experience. Like if you think that after you've done that all and you've got gaps in it, like you can try and fill those gaps with referees. And I think that's what I ended up doing. So um, for what that's worth, I had, I, I erred on um, professional references. I think, well, there you go. That's, that's really great advice. And obviously um, 
some ads a, a case study in success. So no, it's not important. You don't have to have a, an academic reference if uh, you if you feel that your you know your your value as a candidate can be articulated through a more professional lens or or um, uh, you know, a personal lens, perhaps, if your project is, is more, you know, along the lines of, of something related to, to empathy or, 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 or social interactions. Um, uh, and just one final one, it's a really good one. Um, uh, in terms of the letter of invitation, is acceptable? Is it acceptable coming from the project leader or must it come from the head of faculty? Uh, I personally know the project lead and I think it's best coming from them because I'll be working with them if I get there, but uh, will it be taken more seriously coming from the head of school? No, I, I, it, I think it can be definitely the project leader, um, particularly because uh, the, the best, some of the best letters of invitation that I've read um, are where the person who, who is writing it um, is uh, is really enthusiastic about the research. If they're you know particularly if they're involved, if, if they know the candidate, even if they don't know the candidate, but they're but they're they're like, wow, I'm really excited to have this this person um, bring this expertise here and you know use our equipment or, or work with us. Um, I, I think that that's really effective. So yep, absolutely go for, go for um, really the the only requirements for the letter are that it be on on university letterhead and you know there's contact information you know we can verify that they're, they're keen to host you for the duration of your scholarship but besides that um it, it can be it can be anyone uh, who's involved in the research and, and um you know has has some level of authority to to to, to host you there